I always think as an entrepreneur that I've got it all figured out if my, my business is busy. And I think that as I listen to you both talk through it, I, I think that we all have to just slow down and understand our business a little better and really refine the small details of our business so that we are ultimately profitable. Okay, welcome back to Restaurantology, the uh, study of restaurants. I love the word restaurantology, I gotta be honest. Who came up with that? We were sitting in actually your house probably five, six years ago. I can't can't remember that. We had a ton of ideas. Restaurantology stuck the moment, it was actually Austin who said it. The, no mo- the moment he said it, everybody was like, that's it. Austin Smith. Yep. Good job. We miss you. Yes, so restaurantology do. is cool. And people say, what is restaurantology? And we say, well, it's the study of restaurants. And it's like, that's what we're going to do. We're going to study them. And we're going to operate them. We're going to own them. We're going to invest into them. We're going to grow them. <laughs> yeah, it's a master <laughs> we're gonna class. Do it, all. it is a master class. So I'm here today with one of my partners, Taylor Dehart, uh, one of our principals in the investment team of Savory. And you've been with me how long? Nine years. That's a little bit of time. That's right. And in that amount of time, in nine years, you have probably witnessed um, the growth and expansion of more than most people will in their lifetime um, listening to this podcast. And you've seen it from a very different lens, too, because you've been on the investor side. But then you've worked really closely with the operating side, right, which is kind of unique for investors because a lot of times investors will invest. Then they'll monitor from afar, but they're not like in the trenches really understanding how the sausage is made. And there is pun involved in that one. Yeah. So um, it's been a pretty interesting career so far, I would say. Absolutely. Yeah. Where did you come from, by the way? You didn't start in food. Yeah. So I went to school uh, locally here at uh, BYU. And then... um, For those of you that don't know, that's Brigham Young University. That's right. Yeah. Brigham Young University here. Uh, Locally, we're sitting here in Provo, Utah. But um, I uh, started my career at Apple. Very short stint out there. Got a phone call from you as I was sitting in my one bedroom apartment in Santa Clara. I was working for Apple's retail group at the time. It was really fun. Anytime they build any of their you know stores across their global fleet, it would go through a team of three or four of us. I was, of course, one of the junior members of the team at the time, but um, you know, spent some time out there, loved it. Huge Apple fan. So it was a you know dream job. And what I realized though is I from a career standpoint, I felt like my personality would be better suited to be in you know, smaller organizations building. Um, having more tangible value that I could see along the way. So when I got that phone call from you, hearing about the opportunities that existed um, here and, and what your vision was for what we were going to create, which was very different at the time than what <laughs> Savory wasn't even on the radar. You've gone through just, a couple evolutions. Yeah, Savory wasn't even on the radar. And then, look, I showed up and, you know, as things do, right, the, the future that or the the world that we've created today is very different than the future that you'd laid out on that phone call and we talked um, but it's all been good. That's lesson on aligning yourself with the right people and picking good strategy. Well, I would say that that's a compliment that we were more sweet and savory than Apple. <laughs> so that's <laughs> food to food. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit different. That's right. I think that the one thing that has been really unique, though, as we've grown, uh, you know, throughout the years is we we really look at the nuts and bolts of all the businesses. And as we've become more and more on the investor side, our team, and we're going to introduce another member of our team on the ops side um, today. We, we see a lot, we hear a lot, we talk to a lot of founders, right? I think that in the last five years, it's probably been 1,600 brands, would you say? Mm-hmm. I mean, that we've literally talked to about their business. Um, most of them don't fit really the parameters that we want to invest into at this point in time for our investors. But at the end of the day, um, we see a lot, right? And the thing that I, I would say as an operator myself and as, a, as an entrepreneur is I always feel like when you're running a business, you don't really know if you're winning or if you're losing. <laughs> you're kind of like, I think I'm doing good, but I'm really doing good. And it's been hard, I think, for me uh, from time to time, whether I was doing tech or if I'm helping a business that's, you know, making shoes or, you know, building silencers. Um, you, you sometimes don't really know what the parameters are that you're supposed to to match to or that you're supposed to to guide yourself on. And so a couple of years ago at one of our restaurantology uh, summits, which our Restaurantology Summit this year is October 1st um, here in Salt Lake City. Remember, go to restaurantologysummit.com to register. It's free. We pay for everything. Come and learn all of the tips and tricks and secrets from the Savory team and others. Um, but we did a couple of years ago. We gave a handout that you and your team put together um, that was called the scorecard. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from entrepreneurs that were there, restaurateurs, that said that was one of the single most important things that you could have done for me and for my business because now I know what I'm actually running to. And it was funny because Amir was at our conference 
two years ago. And Amir is from South Block. He was here, did one of our podcasts just a couple uh, a couple months ago. And he actually said on the podcast too, he's like, I had filled out the scorecard. He's like, I'm doing really, really well. And he wanted to like find me and stop me in the hallway and say, look at my numbers. My numbers are like perfect in the whole line. And I'm like, oh yeah, cool, man. Yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. never, never really circled back around except for two years later, we were like, you are a brand that we would like to invest into. So he was crushing it the whole time. I should have probably listened. Um, so the scorecard. To tell me what is on the scorecard from an investor standpoint that you think is so valuable for them to understand. And then we're going to actually break down each one of them as much as we can in the short time that we have um, with our other partner that I'm going to have join you. Uh, her name is Jessica Moyer. Um, she's our vice president of learning and development. Um, probably one of the most, uh, I would say, sophisticated operators I've ever seen. So she actually looks at things in a, in a light that I don't think anybody else does. And I think that every time she talks, I could just listen and shut up. Um, because I would learn something. So I think that everybody's going to to learn something here today. But I'll have you guys go through each one of those sections and figure out how does an operator hear that and then do it. And then you explain why it's important from the investor side. But what's on the investor scorecard and why do we put it on there? Yeah, what's funny about the investor scorecard is the the things that we put on there, they're very straightforward. And everybody knows that these are the things that matter in the restaurant industry. But we finally put metrics to them. And we spent some time just explaining you know, why, why it's important to investors and just giving people, um, a view into, and I'll say the lens of the investor, but also it's just, it's a different language. I think operations and investors, they just, they speak differently. Um, but they're all managing toward the same thing. And so we're going to, you know, we'll spend some time today with Jessica talking through what the, what the languages look like, but ultimately what we broke down is probably categorically into three different topics. First is sales. So same store sales growth. We're looking to see healthy sales and we'll d- dive into that. Um, later in the show. Um, but also sales per square foot. Are you being efficient with your space? Um, you know, how how much revenue are you able to generate from the square footage that you're taking? If you're, if you're super uh, efficient, it's really good for you because that means you're going to be able to sign leases that are very affordable and you have a bunch of people that want your product out of a small space. If you're having to sign, you know, multiple thousand, five to 10,000 square foot leases just to get $5 million in revenue, it's a, it's a different world. Yeah. Um, you know, next bigger uh, is not always better is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. No, you, you want to find the right mix, right? Smaller is not always better either. You want yeah, to find sure. the right balance for your concept. What's going to work. People want to be in, people want to take out, just depends on finding that right mix. And that comes through trial and error. Um, the second I would call is the bucket, uh, is, uh, efficiency metrics. So looking at prime cost, um, you know, we define prime cost, and I think the industry broadly does this as your food and your labor. So food and labor are the two largest expenses you're going to have on your P&L and being efficient there, both in your menu and the way that you deploy your menu, as well as how you deploy your labor is, is very important. A brand that has very high prime costs will, will never scale. It just doesn't. Well, it'll make and break you too. I think that it, with the scorecard too, and I, I guess I would ask you this before I introduced uh, Jessica into this conversation, but do, do we as an investment team pull every brand through the scorecard though, before we actually engage and move forward further? Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. We, we have an internal scorecard that we measure and track. And we had a few other metrics that are more qualitative, the quality of the management team. But from a financial standpoint, these metrics are all how we measure. And then we compare them, you know, to one another. And then we look at the backdrop of, you know, the you know, hundreds of brands that we have sitting on our scorecard today. And then we make a decision of which one should we select. And I think it's important, too, for everybody to hear this, because I think it's funny when people try to make a claim that they're perfect and everybody else is not. We are not perfect at Savory either. I think that we're all operating to that scorecard, right? So what Mm -hmm. we're explaining today is something that we're also still trying to do with all of our brands. And once we can kind of get them all within that range, then we know that the asset or that brand or that company is really on a trajectory of greatness, Mm -hmm. right? There's times that within a, a business that you need to pause and perfect your business and get it back on rails and kind of get it into those different parameters before you add more. So sometimes people think more is better. Take as much business as you can. We'll figure it out later. Implosion is a real thing. You, you've got to make sure that you don't implode your business. You don't over lever it. You don't think too big for what your appetite can actually manage um, because that could be dangerous for you as well. So for you guys to dig into it a little bit more and then I'll come back into the conversation. I'm going to turn it over to Jessica Moyer, our VP of Learning and Development, and you to kind of go through each of those on the scorecard. Sound good? Amazing. Jessica. Well, welcome, Jessica. Um, Hi. I'm excited to uh, go back and forth on some of these topics today. Um, you know, you and I have worked together for five plus years now, and I've always considered you a great sounding board. Um, you know, whatever I'm trying to analyze a business or try to understand if it's something that's wor- 
uh, worthy of investment or something you want to spend time on. Having your lens as an operator, you've always done a very good job of being able to take mandates that are given to you either at the board level or at an investment team level and be able to take that and translate that into what it actually looks like from a behavior standpoint. I think what I found is as we've gone through diligence with so many brands, as we've invested in the space and lived in the space for so long, that they're really, I would even call them two different languages. There's the, the language of the operator and the language of the investor. And what's funny is everyone has the same goal. Um, but the languages and the methods and how they're getting there are are two different things. We created this investor scorecard. And uh, from an operating standpoint, I think it's helpful to understand what behaviors actually help drive toward that. So I'm excited to have this conversation with you um, to talk through how how you can take what we're saying is going to lead to the optimal outcome and the best score mm-hmm. um, for the businesses that we're looking into. And you can help uh, every all of our listeners just understand what does it look like to change my operating behaviors day in and day out? How do I actually communicate to my team? How do I emphasize what really matters in the day-to-day? Yeah. So looking forward to that, let's let's start with, Andrew and I just touched on a few items here, but let's start with same store sales growth. And it's a, you know, on, the, on one end of the spectrum, it can be considered a buzzword in the industry. It's always talked about if you read any 10K from Starbucks to uh, Shake Shack, everyone's talking about it. Um, it's an it's an important metric. And I would say from our lens, what it tells us as an investor is that the core of your business is healthy, that the people that are walking into your restaurants are enjoying the experience enough so that they're coming back and they're probably bringing people with them and that your marketing efforts are are successful. You're attracting new customers. You're bringing back your existing customers. That's attractive to an investor. It means that we can grow the value of our business without having to take initial or excuse me, incremental risk. Mm-hmm. We don't have to put more stores in the ground to grow the value of our business. We're growing it based on a core that we've already taken. That's extremely important to us as investors. Easier said than done, though, right? I love seeing it show up on a spreadsheet <laughs> and I love seeing it show up on a document. But as you think about same store sales growth and by association, same store transaction growth and same store check growth, um, which everyone is very focused on. How do you think about what behaviors drive sales growth? Um, And what have you seen be successful in your decades of experience in this industry? What behaviors drive same store, well, same store sales growth? I think the way that you described it is perfect. Where you're really trying to, it is an indicator that says that year over year, our customers are continuing to be loyal to us in whatever way. Uh, you also said same store transactions, which I think it, it's a good way to differentiate, at least from an operator lens. When I think of same store sales growth or when I see it and I look at it from an operator's lens, what I'm looking at is how is very specific tactical things that happen in the restaurant. One of them is more on the strategy side. Sometimes when we look at different brands and their same store sales growth is in the 20 plus, the very first thing that we discuss is what kind of price increases have they done throughout the year? Because there is easy way to manipulate that number so it looks good on paper. And it is actually part of playing the game, right? We need to be able to remain competitive. You need to be able to have that show up on your prime costs, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, But the first lever to pull is what does that look like when it comes to my pricing? Am I continuing to be as competitive as I need to be? Or am I pricing my product in a way that it's still delivering the profitability that I'm expecting? Uh, So that's going to be one big thing when I look at same store sales growth. Same store sales growth without same store transactions tells two different stories. When your transactions are continuing to grow year over year, that to me is an indicator of a lot of different things. It's an indicator of the staffing of that restaurant. It's an indicator of the line speed of that restaurant. It's an indicator of whatever we're doing, whether it's LTOs, things that are creating a level of attraction to the brand that is making people want to come back multiple times. So if we have our regular customer that eats with us twice a week, month they're coming three times a month what are what are the levers that we're doing to attract that person to come in again so one without the other is telling a conflicting story you can have same store sales growth and have it look really good on paper but see a decline in same store transactions which we see across some of our brands mm-hmm. frankly and when you're seeing that story on the operations lens, I immediately, well, we do this all the time. We go directly into the restaurants and we start seeing what does that consumer experience look like? Are we fast? Is the quality of our food the way that we, we're expecting it to be? 
our employees engaging in a level of hospitality that we would all be really proud of? Is it happening to us? Or are we being, are we strategically trying to get ahead of it and putting strategies in place to bring it back to life? Meaning, are we focusing on line speed? Are we focusing on the quality of our food? Are we focusing on that interaction between that employee and that customer? Those would be a couple of things that I would be looking at. Yeah, I love that. And there's a couple of things that I think we can, that we can dig in on there. First off, you mentioned there's, there's a band of same store sales growth that, that maybe you consider healthy and mm-hmm. and that that are driven by just kind of your normal earning additional brand equity, earning additional uh, customers coming in your door. There's also, if it gets too high, it, it waves a red flag for you. Mm-hmm. You look at it and you say, okay, something's going on here. There's either a shift in consumer demand, right? And, and that happens. We actually have experienced that on our side. We have a brand that you know, through COVID was excellent at drive-through execution and grew, you know, 40 plus percent um, same store sales growth. And all of a sudden, you know, we were getting questions from investors who um, we were speaking to, who they were like, is this real? And then the next year came by and we grew on that. And the next year came by and we grew on that. And everybody finally, after like three years said, okay, this is real. But when that, when it's such a big number, right. And and something in the macro environment is driving that it does take some time to dig into that a little bit. Alternatively, you mentioned price increases. Mm -hmm. Um, Price increases, if you, if you're not strategic about them, you can find yourself in a situation where you're taking a short-term win for a long-term loss. If you are uh, pumping through a price increase, it usually takes consumers, what we see manifest in the data, two or three months to kind of get used to those prices. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're going to come in and if there is some sticker shock according to the price increase, they're going to be, they're going to feel it. Um, they might come one or two more times and then eventually you may price yourself out. So um, we have seen that happen, you know, before as well. Um, if you were to prioritize same store transaction growth versus same store check growth, which mm-hmm. one of those two do you think is most important? Because you mentioned both. Pricing is important. You have to make sure that you're keeping up with, especially in this inflationary environment we've been living in, so that you have healthy margins overall. Mm-hmm. If you were to say if one of those two, two things are most important to you as an operator, you know, what's what's most important? What is more important, same store sales growth or same store transactions transaction growth. I think that they both inform the other. Uh, So for example, at the beginning of this year, one of the, uh, last year was challenging to say the least. 2023 was a very challenging year. And when we were looking at what we were going to do to grow sales, uh, the indic the levers that you pull on same store transaction, same store sales growth end up being informed by the same sort of transaction growth. You're able to see how it's affecting guests coming back into your building. Uh, one of the biggest things that I had concerns with at the beginning of the year was uh, the third party dynamic. So what would that look like if we, for example, lowered prices on third party and uh, we started getting a little bit more competitive there because during COVID or, or in the last few years, the third party blew up, right? And it almost became uh, a lever that was easy to pull. Let's increase prices on third party by 15, 20, 25% because there wasn't anything, there was no indicator that if we were to increase our pricing to offset the fees that we get charged on third party by 25%, which I think is the max on some of these companies, that our transactions on those channels would stay the same, meaning that guests were still taking advantage of the convenience factor and it wasn't necessarily affecting their spending patterns, which I thought was really interesting. So when we started seeing a dip in our third-party sales, it was like maybe we got to that point. Maybe that three-month lag happened and we started to see that our sales started going down specifically through that channel. So now if we were to lower our prices in that channel, would it start increasing our transaction size? And we did. We were able to, in some cases, we... We've been doing a lot of back and forth and trying to figure out what is that good balance? At what point is it that we increase or decrease the pricing and we start seeing a benefit on the transaction side? That is where I think you you can't look at one without looking at the other. And if you do look at one without looking at the other, you're just living with the narrative, with the story that feels good in that moment. Because if if your sales are going up, sales are going up, I'm going to put that in quote, quotes because of a price increase, but your transactions start dipping down. You just did that to your consumer. 
And that is not a good experience. We're in a relationship together. And this relationship is built on the fact that I'm giving you a product that you want to come back for. If you're not coming back for it, that's a problem. We, it, we've sat recently in a couple diligence conversations and uh, one of the, the, pre- the conversation around pricing came up. And it was like, do you feel like your pricing is too expensive? And what I heard this person say, which I thought was really interesting was, well, I hear from our consumer that they wish they could eat more. They could eat with us more because, uh, but so they, in that moment, that narrative that they're hearing is not that we're too expensive. It's that if our consumer had more money, they would eat with us more often, which I thought was such an interesting take on that. My take on that for my lens is you are too expensive or the consumer would come to you more. Does that? So there, th- there's these moments where you end up living with whatever narrative you feel comfortable with. Mm-hmm. If at the end of the day, it's producing the profit that you're wanting, that's great. But you need to be able to look at both of those numbers and have one inform the other. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay? yeah that totally does. And I think maybe I want to follow up on uh, on this a little bit more. You You talked about this almost like relationship, this, uh, you know, personal relationship that a brand has with its consumers. And I think that's very real in restaurant. There's almost a trust element, right? Trust is incredibly important in in any, you know, any relationship. And for a consumer to have trust in a brand is a big deal. Um, You know, I think part of the reason why um, some of the brands who compete on Ubiquity, some of the ones who are everywhere, McDonald's, I can have the same experience in the Tokyo airport as I do in Lehigh, Utah, yes. at a McDonald's. You know, for the most part, the, it's consistent. They have a similar product. I can trust that I'm going to get something that's there. So as we as consumers, we're very habitual. If you look at, you know, you look at all the data, there's really only a handful of places where we all go out to eat at restaurants. How as a, as a business, um, can you build trust with your consumers such that they can come back on a consistent basis and and maybe price they become less price sensitive. We spend a lot of time here talking about price, but maybe what are some of those things that you can do tactically inside of your restaurant, the way that you build your culture, the way that you um, grow your business to build trust with the consumer, whether it be in, you know, whenever I show up, I know I get it in this amount of time or mm-hmm. whenever I show up, I know that this is the type of quality that I could expect. What are yeah. maybe just some thoughts on how in the operations of my business can I build trust from between my brand and my consumer so that they'll come back more frequently? Yeah. I think that's a really good question. I I always tend to break things down in beginning, middle, and end. And when I think of the interaction that we have with our customers, uh, the very the way that we build trust is by building a level of consistency. Uh, and that consistency happens at the beginning, which means the moment you walk into that restaurant, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Is it clean? Is it inviting? Uh, are there is there a smiling face that's there greeting me? That's First step, first level of consistency, the engagement that I have with the actual uh, building itself or with the online interaction and with the employee, that's going to be the very first part for me anyway. So when you're looking at building consistency or breakdown in your same store sales or your same store transactions, that's the very first thing that you have to look at is what message am I delivering to my consumer, that relationship? Am I building trust the moment they walk into the building? And I'm going to tell you right now that it is so rare that that trust gets built consistently that most of us are surprised when it is consistent. Like we can maybe name four or five different companies that deliver a consistent experience every time. And those are the ones that have been doing it for a very, very long time to their credit, right? So when you're building a business, it's going to start with, when you walk in the building and the interaction that you have with your employee or with that employee, that first uh, interaction. The second part is going to be the delivery of the food. So once I've put my order in, what does it come out on time? Does it come out accurately? And does it come out in a, in the consistency piece there is how do I have to wait 10 minutes? Do I have to wait 15 minutes? Do I have to wait 20 minutes? Am I being told that this is going to be an extra wait? Uh, you need to be able to trust that once you place your order, if it is going to take, I would say more than four to five minutes is where most of our consumers start getting a little antsy and you start seeing the peeking around the corner and figuring out what's going on. If you, you need to be telling your person, your customer that this is going to take an X amount of time if it's over four or five minutes, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. 
And then from there, it need, you, the food has to be accurate and you need to nail it every single time. The presentation needs to be intentional. And the accuracy is so important. All of us have been in that scenario where you go to your favorite restaurant and you order your favorite food and it doesn't come with, they left something off of it or you don't get the salad dressing with the salad. It is one of those moments of fury for me. Do you feel the same way? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, what's funny is you like you talk about this experience where not only are you going there with yourself, but you take your friends and family to your favorite restaurants. You're mm-hmm. like, hey, I discovered something. Yes. And I say this a lot when we're talking to, when we're raising you know capital for our funds, I, you know, the way that we describe the types of brands that we like to invest into is like, these are the types of brands that you like to take your friends and family to. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that, you know, seems to resonate, you know, you're not going to, you know, if somebody flies in to see you and visit you, you're not going to take them to the chain that they can visit at home. You're going to go to the place that can be you know discovered locally. Mm-hmm. And if you take your friends and family there and you put yourself on the line and you're raving about this dish that you love or about this menu item or just this concept overall, and it doesn't deliver, there's almost a feeling of embarrassment. And like the trust has been violated at that point. Mm-hmm. Like I put, I put my neck out for you. And this is a funny situation because it's not like it's a human being. This is a, you know, this is a restaurant brand that you're talking about, but like it's that intimate when it comes to our food choices. It We're is. that habitual. It's that important that when I take my friends and family, I want them to have a great experience. And if if you violate that consistency that you're talking about, it can be pretty damaging to the types of habits that we're trying to create amongst our consumer base. Yes, it really is. And what's interesting is when you have a good relationship with a brand, you excuse the bad. Like you can have a couple bad visits. You can have a couple bad moments. It's like, oh, it's not not always like this. But when a brand is is consistently inconsistent, that is when you start seeing it uh, play out in the reporting. Mm -hmm. That's when your same store sales growth is not one week, up one week down, one week up, one week down, but it slowly just starts going. It's a downward trend. Same thing with transactions. So what I talked about just to kind of put this all together, the beginning, walking into the building, having that interaction with that employee, getting your order taken, and then you get your food and it's presented in a specific way and the order is accurate is very, very important. And then the last part is just what those are the finishing touches. I feel like that's when hospitality comes into play. Does the manager come over and see how your food was? Uh, is there someone actively pre-bussing or taking your plates away from you? Are they presenting you with to-go containers? There's an opportunity there, especially in our industry, especially with how much it's grown in the last few years, uh, to delight, to delight the customer. And I think when you start looking at, you start seeing a trend up or down, it's never happens on accident. It's either happening, there's positive momentum because those three things are being done intentionally, or there's negative momentum because those three things are consistently inconsistent. And when that trust is broken, uh, it's it hurts on both sides because you loved this restaurant at some point and you want to give it another chance. But when you give it a chance and it's great and then you give it another chance, it's not so good. Then you give it, it with the inconsistency is what creates a change in consumer behavior every single time. And if I were sit when we're sitting around looking at numbers and we think, what are we going to do about this? Those are the main things that we go and do. We do restaurant visits and we see what the first half of that interaction looks like. What does the middle look like? What does the end look like? Are we giving people a compelling reason to come back? And it's all very specific tactical things that you can do. Yeah, I love that. And I think that you, um, you, know, you touched on how we're looking at our own portfolio and the restaurants that, that you uh, work on behalf of. Um, and it's always a joy to watch how that lens gets applied when we're looking into a restaurant. Uh, to bring this you know, maybe full circle, right? We've talked about the importance of consumer trust. I think we've touched on the fact that same store sales growth begins the moment you open the door, right? It's it's how you prepare your restaurant for when that customer walks in at the very beginning. It's how you treat them when they walk in. It's how you deliver the food. It's how you prep the food even before the doors are open. And then it's how you close your restaurant as well. It's how you clean at the end of the day. There's There's so many things about um, growing sales that it feels like what you've described to me is that there's not a moment in the open hours of a restaurant where you're not building sales, whether you're cleaning a table, whether you're cleaning the restaurant, whether you're, you know, prepping at 6am, um, for a future day, every single person is responsible for building sales across the entire organization. Yeah. 
I I agree with you. And it, we could go into so many more details. Like even before uh, when the team gets there in the morning, what does that look like? What does the engagement look like? Who's keeping them moving and making sure that we are um, managing that process throughout the the entire morning so that by the time we're open, not at 11, you're seeing a, a team running around trying to get ready, but at 1045, you're ready with your team. You're having a really good pre-shift meeting. You're engaging with them. You're talking to them about the goals that you have for the day and what every single individual's role is going to be in bringing the strategy to life that day. Uh, that's the pre-shift. And then during the shift, what does it look like? Are you paying attention to these moments, to these touch points with the employee? At the end of the shift, are you telling people, hey, this is what you did well. This is what you need to work on. You can break down the intentionality around every single aspect, every minute of that day uh, is what creates a consistent result. And all of it is behavioral, in my opinion. I'm not I actually care very little about the score. Uh, and I don't know if that's even safe to say. <laughs> the score is a direct reflection of how the game is being played. And you can walk into any restaurant and get a horrible experience. And I could probably tell you whether or not they are running a profitable business. It does like those two things don't usually happen. What? The, a bad experience and profitability doesn't usually happen hand in hand. It's when it, everything is done consistently that you start seeing lines out the door at your favorite restaurant and things just start coming together a little bit better. Yeah, I, I love that last comment because it it goes down to, and it, like I'm a spreadsheet guy, I'm a finance guy, I'm an investment on my side. And I'll be the first to tell any of our, our brands, if you lead through a spreadsheet, you will fail. Yes. So I love what you just said because- you know, you don't get great at controlling the scoreboard here by being great at controlling a scoreboard, right? You get you get good at it by executing the play on a consistent basis, executing mm -hmm. an offense or defense or whatever you want to call it, whatever analogy you want to use. Um, it's it's by execution, it's behavior. So I think that this conversation has, you know, we, we started by talking about maybe these two different languages. You focused on behaviors. You focused on things that people can do before, during, and after uh, a, a day to build sales. Mm -hmm. And I get excited when I see um, numbers that are sent over to me where I see that manifest on a consistent basis. And because I get to have the benefit of working with those like you and interacting with operators on a day-to-day -day basis, I know that that just doesn't happen based on a formulaic result. It is it is really all about, are you doing the right things? Are you enforcing the right behaviors? Are you mm -hmm. focusing on the right culture inside of your restaurants and treating your customers in a positive way? Yeah. So bringing it full circle on same-store sales growth there's not such thing as too high, but there is such thing as it's so high that we have to dig into it a little bit more. For sure. Um, so we have to understand what's going on either on a macro level or maybe you did a price increase and so the numbers are artificially inflated. Mm -hmm. But there's a healthy level of same-store sales growth that can be achieved through same-store transaction growth that comes as a result of earning and building trust with your consumers over time mm -hmm. so that you consistently have a, um, a healthy relationship with that person. Yeah. So shifting to, um, you know, from revenue, now over to profitability. Now, so on a on a macro level, I'll just give the investor lens. We're an industry that um, we the values for our companies they're derived off of the cash flow that we generate. the The amount or the work that consumes capital inside of this industry is the development work. It's the building of the new stores. It's the opening programs that we're putting in place so that we can scale our businesses. But at a unit level, once we open a restaurant, we expect those stores to cash flow. Um, and to be able to contribute to the overall organization, to be able to help uh, in a lot of ways. A, a really healthy organization, an investable organization, should have options uh, when it comes to cash flow. They should be generating enough cash so that they have options to use that cash from operations, to use that for future growth, or even distribute it to partners, whatever their priorities are. Secondarily, if you're generating cash flow, you're also bankable. And if you're bankable, that means that you may be able to go and get a loan from a regional bank, you know, depending upon where you are in the life cycle or maybe even a much larger organization um, down the road. But no matter what, cash flow is the, uh, is the lifeblood that flows through this industry. And so profitability matters and it matters a lot. And from an investor standpoint, we found that uh, we, when we're going to embark on a new scale phase, scale never adds profitability ever. 
the amount of people that I can tell you that have come to me and be like, if I just had um, your guys's contracts, I would be more profitable. I wish they were right. Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, do we have uh, great contracts across, across the board? Absolutely. Do we save them money? Yes. All of those things are true. We can find savings on food and labor and everything else through scale. That does exist. A lot of the larger organizations have that benefit. But there are costs associated with scale that are different than the costs associated with just getting your first five to 10 open. And so I would say is those two offset each other. And so the burden is to figure out at the level you're at right now, and it's where say reinvest is between five and 15 restaurants, you have to find a way to make your unit economics incredible. What I'm talking about there is store level EBITDA. Store level EBITDA is um, your unit economics. That's the number that matters the most to determine your your future growth. I think well, as we talk about profitability, let's start by talking about what uh, you know store level EBITDA needs to be. And I'll kind of give a, a little bit of a range. And then you and I can spend some time talking about the two most important areas for that, which are our cost of goods sold and our labor costs. So as I think about store level EBITDA, I'll tell you that somewhere in the mid-teens, for fast casual concepts, which is generally, you know, the concepts that are growing today, casual concepts maybe have a slightly different um, view, but for the most part, they're consistent. If you think about uh, fast casual concepts and casual concepts, 15-ish percent store level EBITDA, that's a good business. It's not a great business and it's probably not scalable. If you're finding your way up into that 18% range, you're better. There's there's an opportunity to... Um, grow that brand as long as you're consistent in your revenue and you're consistent in the way that you're able to perform across multiple markets. But what when it gets really interesting is when store level EBITDA is greater than 22%. That is the very best. Those are the brands that have a lot of opportunity for future growth. And I would just describe they have margin for error. They can take a little bit of time going into a new market and figure things out because they've built their unit economics in their home market to be 22% plus store level EBITDA so that they can find themselves taking a little bit more trial and error and a little bit more risk and achieving product market fit in more markets than just their own. So I lay that out to say, you know, some brands, they, they look at that and they're like, that's easy. But I would say for the most part, 90% of brands, 95% even, are unable to achieve those store level EBITDA margins. And that describes why you know, this, this business is so, it's so difficult to scale. It's, it's not an easy um, industry. Most restaurant operators are, you know, 70% of, of all of them are one unit or below. Um, and it's because they've built a great business for themselves and they can have, they can have the good and even some of the better margins that I described 15 to 18%. That's amazing if you're not looking to scale, mm -hmm. but if you're wanting this to be a nationwide brand that is going to be able to execute in New York as well as Los Angeles. That's going to be able to span across the whole country. And if you have a vision for that, you really have to have unit economics that look a lot like what I've described so far, 22 plus percent at the store level. So I say all of that, that is so much easier said than done, right? Mm -hmm. I have this benefit of being an investor and being able to look at it and say, you know what, I just, I've seen this story before. I've lived this for a, almost a decade and have seen data from businesses spanning over the last 20 years um, of performance here and just know what it takes from a financial standpoint to what can scale versus what doesn't. Now, if I'm an emerging restaurateur and I hear those numbers and I'm nowhere close to that <laughs> and you've maybe lived there a little bit and, um, you know, in some of the brands you've operated historically, you know, how, how does, how does that land on you? If I'm describing that to you, mostly just looking for your feedback and then we can dive into more of the, um, you know, what it looks like to actually get there. How does 22% land? Uh, it seems like a pretty big number, uh, but it also depends on the state of my business. Uh, I think in order, there's a couple of things that the brands that are able to get there do really well. And I think that maybe that's where my mind goes initially. Uh, the number one thing is creating efficiencies in your prime costs, whatever that efficiency looks like. So I'm going to go very specific, but uh, if we're looking at COGS, by the way, when we say COGS, we're saying every single thing that goes into the preparation of food, creating efficiency in COGS, meaning that different ingredients are being utilized in different ways in all of the different recipes that you have within your restaurant. You're not bringing in one ingredient that you're paying a premium for that's only going to be used for one item. You're able to be efficient in the way that your uh, menu is designed. That would be something very tactical that I think is worth looking at. If you have a couple of items that are very different 
difficult to source that are very expensive that only go into one item, uh, you're probably not creating the level of efficiency needed from the very beginning. The other piece is the efficiency on the labor side. Uh, The brands that we have that are consistently over 22% store level EBITDA, one of the things that they do well is they're unicorns in the labor model. And this is how I would describe a labor unicorn in the food industry is there is no separation of responsibilities. Every individual can do everything. You have generalists across the board. In our industry, the moment that you start specializing and or separating, whether it is uh, responsibilities or uh, geographically, you're separating someone completely from one side of the building to another, you create inefficiencies. That inefficiency immediately is going to increase your labor costs. That's just the way that it works. So if you look at some of the restaurants that are able to consistently deliver the 22% or above, 22% would be unicorn status. All of them have that in common. They have a, they created their recipes in a very efficient way. Uh, they created a their labor in a very efficient way. Uh, and as a result, these the the twenty two percent is a little bit easier, quote unquote. I'll give you an example of inefficiencies in labor. Uh, it would be when you are starting to open your second, third, or fourth location, and you're like, you know what? We need an extra space for this specific, whatever it may be, for our to-go area needs to be bigger. And then you create your to-go area where in your first restaurant, it was just part of your cashier station, let's say. So customers would just come up and the same, they were standing in the exact same line where they would place their order, they would come pick up their order. Now in your new restaurant, you are taking that area and you're separating it completely. So now you have a cashier that's on one one side of the building and then a pickup area on the right side of the building. Uh, that is immediately creating inefficiencies. Now you have two people that it takes to staff that area that in your first location only took one. And it's little moments like that where uh, you think you're doing the right thing. It's the new shiny penny. You feel like it's going to create a better experience. And maybe it does for your consumer. But in reality, that experience actually gets uh, diluted because before I just had to walk in. I had to talk to one person. That person was there. They were available and they were like, yeah, here's your food. Now you're going into a restaurant that is probably trying to be efficient with their labor. Uh, but you have this one cashier because you didn't decide to add that second one. I'm a customer at the pickup and I'm going there to pick up my order. There's nobody there to greet me. I have to go and search and walk over to the next person to be like, hey, can I come pick up? Can I? Can you give me my food? Because you're helping someone in front of you. I see you smiling because it's such a common thing. <laughs> I've, well, I've lived it and I'm smiling because I'm sitting here listening. And Andrew started this uh, podcast by saying we're not perfect. <laughs> and like, I, I know you've lived this. Like we we, we lived yes. exactly this. We had this thought and we, we had... And we have smart consultants and smart designers and people are like, this is a great idea. This is the new age in a post-COVID environment. Have right. a separate takeout center so that it doesn't interfere with the rest of the restaurant yes. when people walk in. And we drank the Kool-Aid, for uh-huh. lack of a better term. And, and we've learned through our own mistakes to that that wasn't the <laughs> that wasn't the best way for us to pursue it. So I'm smiling because as I'm sitting here watching you describe this, like we've lived this and we've made this decision. For those of us who are for, for those who are listening, please learn from our mistakes. We we say that all the time. We've we you know we're not perfect. We've we've learned a lot of expensive lessons along the way. Yeah, um, deploying a you know a couple hundred million dollars across this industry over the last decade. If you think about the lessons we've learned, some of them have just been through sheer operations and sheer grit, and it's been fantastic. Others have been painful and expensive. Um, yeah. And I'm hearing you describe this like, you know, this is in the painful and expensive category. <laughs> and so I'm I'm smiling because we've lived it, we've done it to ourselves and we've learned from it. And hopefully those of our listeners can apply this lesson and and uh, learn from our mistakes. Yes, it is painful and expensive and it feels in the moment that it's the right thing to do. So what I am not saying is don't have a separate area for pickup. What I am saying is make sure that you're looking at it from both sides, from the consumer convenience and also from what it's going to do to your labor model. If it's going... It is a very uh, expensive mistake to add an area without thinking about how you're going to staff it. And the moment that you create an inefficiency in your model, meaning that it takes two people now to do a one-person job, uh, it is something that you are going to have to deal with forever unless you decide to completely remodel the buildings. Uh, Another good example of 
an inefficiency in a labor model would be uh, with our partnership with SWIG. When we first started, there was the shack. And you probably have seen the shack as you go through some of our SWIGs. Um, One of the first things we did with that partnership was realizing that that was inefficient. You had one employee who was sitting in this shack uh, taking orders. And again, that is a move that was done because it's like, let's figure out a way to get our orders taken uh, faster so we could stack more cars. It was the right thing to do uh, for um, a speed of service and a transaction side, right? However, you immediately isolate a portion of your labor pool. That person can no longer help you. When it's slow, they're just sitting there. When there's no cars, they're just sitting there. So it was an active decision. Let's make, let's not staff the shack anymore. Let's figure out how we can get the tablets out and start stacking orders. So that way, when it's slow, we don't lose an entire individual. They're able to come back and help us. So it's these little tactical moments that make a re- that make a really big difference. And in my opinion, the difference between a 15% and a 22% is a hyper-efficient labor model and a hyper-efficient menu, whatever that looks like for your brand. And, and, and I'm listening to what you're saying. And, and what I'm hearing is it's not, it's not about giving the consumer a worse experience than they would get otherwise. It's Never. about, it's about just making sure that everybody who is there is engaged and active. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's incredibly important. Yes. No idle hands. Yes. That is what I preach in the labor world. Uh, I don't know if I've just been in this business for so long, but the moment I walk into a restaurant, all I see are idle hands. Like you are not being efficient. You are not being efficient. There's some under management that's happening. There's things that can be done. And it, it doesn't need to be that you're busy the entire time with a customer. The idle hands need to be busy based off of either the to-do list, the guest, or helping some another one of your employee, an, yeah. an employee out. But there should be a limited amount of idle hands in your building at any given time. If they're not doing anything, they're not efficient. If they're not efficient, we need to figure out how to redistribute it. And we talked about when we were talking about same store sales growth, which was every single employee has a hand in sales building activities. Yes, so if literally. someone's isolated, yeah. and if someone is, you know, watching Netflix in a shack, <laughs> which that never happened. <laughs> never. Um, but uh, that that doesn't, that's that's not sales building behavior. That's no. not, you know, profit um, enhancing behavior. Mm-hmm. So we've talked about labor a little bit. Um, you know, the other side of prime costs are costs of goods sold. Uh, it's, a lot of that has to do with the, the way that you price your menu, what you're delivering to people, what your portioning is. Um, in the last few minutes that we have here um, in our discussion, talk to us about some of the behaviors that you um, think are most important for creating the the best cost of goods sold outcome. Again, you don't want to, you know, give your, you don't want to lower portions automatic, automatically, not that that might be interesting. You don't want to lower portions. You don't want to always increase price. Those are things that you can only do so much. So mm-hmm. what are some of the things you can do behind the scenes that won't, won't affect consumers' pocketbooks? Mm-hmm or won't affect their perception of value of your brand, but can help you manage your cost of goods sold. And after we go through that, I'll attach some numbers to how we think about prime costs, but I just want to emphasize some of these behaviors first. You've talked through labor. Let's go through COGS, and then we can talk about maybe how casual and fast casual brands get there and what metrics they, um, you know, we we perceive based on everything that we've seen to be successful. Yeah, for sure. Uh, So a couple things on COGS. I'm going to start with the very basic. Uh, When you are growing a brand, there is a lot of information that lives in someone's mind. So one of the easiest ways to create efficiency is just getting your recipes and everything written down, the process, what you do so that it can scale and it's consistent because COGS is a consistency game at the end of the day. Uh, so that would be number one. And this is going to like, I know it's a no brainer, but write, write how you should be doing, how you should be building the plates and what the recipe should look like down. Make sure that that is written down, that it's consistent in every single one of the restaurants. If it can exist in a digital platform, I would highly recommend that just so that you don't have the paper that you have to be circulating. And then that always ends up being, oh, you didn't update one version 1.1 or 1.2 in the world of digital media. I would Almost encourage people just to create an Instagram page just for your restaurant where that exists if you need to, that only your team has access to. You mean the flower covered <laughs> piece of paper that you get handed with the yes. recipe is not a, it's not fun yeah, thing to do as It cannot be like, it's hard to maintain if you decide to make a different, to, to make a change. So yes, it works, but it's also highly inefficient. Uh, 
So that would be number one. Number two, it's really going to come down to how do you make sure that the guest is getting the exact same portions every time? So I'm going to, again, go very, very basic. What are the tools that are being used to portion the items? Whatever that looks like. If you don't have tools, incorporate some tools because it's that level of consistency. I hear it all the time where it's like, oh, well, people just know that this handful is what our portion is. It's like, well, what I deem my the appropriate size is going to be different than yours. And that immediately creates a level of inconsistency, which is going to create inconsistency in COGS. Uh, and then I'm going to go for the other tactical pieces, which is the organization of your restaurants and making sure that everything has a home and everything is in one specific place with a max of a secondary location of one secondary location. Why? Because COGS comes down to being able to accurately account for every single product in your building. Having the right amount of product at the right time in the right places where it's consistently, you can count it and you can see, oh my goodness, I went through what, an entire jar of mayonnaise in the last 24 hours? That is impossible. When you know that because you're so, because everything is in the right place, it makes such a big difference. So again, you could talk about the way the strategy around pricing and all of that. I tend to go with the tactical stuff. The moment you walk into a restaurant, if I see a restaurant that is extremely disorganized, that has multiple home locations for four or five different items, I can tell you immediately that restaurant is not being efficient with their cogs. They have an opportunity. If I see portioning happening on a line with no tools whatsoever and people are just throwing things into a container, you are slowly delivering an inconsistent experience to your guests. And also, you have no idea if the if they got the right amount of food. Therefore, your cogs are going to be higher than they should be. If you have too much product on your shelf, you don't have that mentality that you, you care a little bit less about being wasteful. And that is going to create a waste, which also is going to make it so your cogs are higher. So it's little things like that that I think make a really big difference. The moment you walk into a restaurant, you can see it. At least I can see it. And if you're uh, running a restaurant right now, it's little things that you can do that will make a really big difference. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think one of the brands that we admire the most in our industry is Chipotle. And I think they do what you're describing better than most. Yes. And, and they're not just a unicorn from a consumer standpoint. They are from an investor standpoint. I mean, mm -hmm. they have constantly this store level EBITDA that we're discussing. They have that in troves across the whole country. They're fantastic, but I don't hear a lot of their consumers complaining about their value perception. They portion the right way. They price the right way. Their teams are um, trained successfully to manage that effectively. And as a result, they're, they're not only hyper profitable, but they're well beloved by their consumers. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Awesome. So, as I think about the um, attaching some metrics to it, just so we can, you know, give this. And, and by the way, the scorecard is available. In fact, I had literally as, as recent as a week and a half ago, I had somebody reach out to me who attended Restaurantology two years ago and say, hey, can you send me that again? Um, I, we will send it to anybody. Um, so please feel free to reach out um, to us and we're, we're happy to share that. We, we hand it out freely. But with prime cost, casual and fast casual um, concepts get there differently. Casual concepts tend to have higher labor and slightly lower cost of goods sold than fast casual uh, concepts, mostly because of the service orientation of the business. On the fast casual side, you find yourself with slightly higher cost of goods sold, but lower labor because you're mostly focused on just preparing the food, um, handing them the food, and then and, you know ultimately taking the order and punching it into the cash register. Mm -hmm. But overall, between the two, it's very consistent. If you are between 55 and 60% of revenue as your prime costs, that's the band of good, better, best. I would say at 60%, if you have other synergies, if you have really good occupancy, if you have really good management of your other expenses, you can find yourself with really elite unit economics. But the the better brands and the more consistent brands and the ones that have more margin of error, we find right around 55% or so um, prime costs and somewhere in that band is what's um, going to make it so that you can scale at a broad level. Yeah, agreed. Well, Jessica, this has been fantastic. Hopefully we've been able to give people... Um, I don't know what the right word is. Is it a rubric? Uh, a How does sure. one translate? Rosetta Stone. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. We Hopefully we've been able to provide a Rosetta Stone for people to be able to take uh, financial metrics in the restaurant industry and what investors look at in this investor scorecard uh, into operating behaviors that um, can actually drive that on a day-to-day -day basis and what you can actually influence. 
I think uh, it just doesn't work to walk into your team and be like, hey, gross sales today. Yeah. Or, hey, make labor better. Or, hey, you know, let's let's find a way to, you know, give less food. There's just so many perverse incentives for um, people when you give them that direction. You have to do what we've done today and what you're so good at, which is take it, interpret it, align it with the um, values of the organization and make sure you're emphasizing behaviors that will create those type of outcomes and, and make sure that you win on the scoreboard. The last few things I want to mention, which is this is a little bit more outside the restaurant um, than what we've been talking about today, which is inside the restaurant, is the last two metrics that we look at on our scorecard are occupancy. And we really like to see for emerging brands somewhere around the 6 to 10% range. We see public companies, we monitor them very uh, closely, and we find them around 10% of revenue. But they're massive. They're across multiple states. They're in some of the larger markets across the country. Um for an emerging brand that is still concentrated in their home market where they have all of their brand equity and all their friends and family who love and adore them and all the the community who supports them, we really like to see that number closer to 6%, um, just in, in, in an early uh, early days of the brand. That's important. The sales per square foot of what you're producing matters when you're doing that. That's why that metric is so important as well. And I'll, I'll close by sharing what I believe is the holy grail of restaurant investing, which is cash on cash return. And cash on cash return is, it's pretty straightforward, but it's an, it's a metric that tells you you're investing a certain amount to open your restaurant. And this is how much cash that restaurant is generating after you make that investment. So let me give you an example. It's simple as taking your development cost and dividing it by the annual store level EBITDA or store level profitability that your store is generating. So I think about a million dollar store. Let's say, for example, you open a million dollar store and you're doing $2 $2 million in revenue at 25% store level profitability. The cash on cash payback of that brand would be your million dollars that you invested divided by your $500,000 that you're generating in cash from that restaurant. You would have a two-year payback. A two-year payback is fantastic. If we look at brands and we find a two-year payback, we're very excited about looking and exploring that uh, a partnership there. That is very healthy level. Once that number moves up to around three, in the emerging stage, it's still really good. There's very attractive um, investment opportunities that can take place there. But if you're below three, you're very attractive to an investor. Um, it doesn't really matter at what stage. But in the emerging stage, I'd say we kind of like to see that number between two and three. Once you grow much beyond that, you can actually start to see those numbers trickle between three and five. Because at that point, the business has achieved scale. You now are bankable. You have the ability to introduce um, some other forms of financing that aren't equity financing, and you're generating cash to be able to help take some of this risk from your business. But for the most part, cash on cash return, as I think about it, it is the ultimate holy grail. You have to balance how much you're investing and how much you're generating. If it's off kilter, if that's off balance, doesn't matter how profitable you are in the restaurant. If you're spending $10 million to open that restaurant, it means nothing. Because you, it's going to take you so long to recoup that investment that it's just not worth it. So that ratio is is extremely important, and we, it's it really comes down to there could be a brand that has you know healthy everything, um, but if they don't have really strong cash on cash returns, we'll we'll walk away. All right, Taylor, we've talked about so many things today, and if I am listening to this and I'm thinking, where do I even start? First of all, I'd probably want to listen to it again because it's just gold is what we're providing, right? <laughs> just <laughs> we, kidding. We hope. Yeah, we're hoping. Uh, but there's a couple of things that stand out to me uh, that I want to make sure that are kind of the key takeaways. Uh, you, it's all about the little things when it comes to the behaviors and when it comes to tying in those behaviors to ultimately results that we're looking for. Uh, but start small. Start with the little pieces of the business that matter a lot. We talked a lot about the efficiency in your labor model. You can do something with that. We talked about the organization in the back of house. You can do something with that. You, We talked about the greetings and the way that your employees are interacting with your team. That is something that you can focus on for a month, two months, three months until you really nail it down. Uh, what we're looking for in order to get the results that we're talking about is a consistent business experience as a consumer. We need to remove the consistently inconsistent that is what creates a, a business that ultimately doesn't scale because you can't win over the consumers. All right. And uh, for final thoughts, Andrew, I'm interested to hear how you would, what your big takeaways would be from this conversation. 
that, that was fantastic to listen to you guys both chat through all of that. But my big takeaway would be this, and that is slow down and understand the business that you're in. I, I always think as an entrepreneur that I've got it all figured out if my, my business is busy. And I think that as I listen to you both talk through it, I, I think that we all have to just slow down and understand our business a little better and really refine the small details of our business so that we are ultimately profitable. If you're doing this and you're not making profit, it's not worth it, right? And I think that there's this common fallacy, and I think that we've seen this a lot, Taylor, in what we do on the investment side, but there's this fallacy that restaurants are so, so risky, you can't make money that they all fail. Well, that's just not true. In fact, if they all failed, none of us would eat because we all eat out every single day of our lives. Um, And I think every single business has risks um, that are similar to this, and that is if you don't manage your profit, then you're not going to be in business. You have to be in uh, in business with profits. Unless you're a tech company like I used to do and you can just keep raising money and keep filling the hole of the money that you're burning, which makes zero sense to me, even though I'm ex-tech. So I think the most important thing here today is for you to listen to what uh, Taylor and Jessica talked about, and that is to refine your business and really understand what matters most to the actual bottom line number that you generate. How many times do we look at a business, which is fascinating to me that we look at a business and they say, oh, well, we're doing $5 million a year in this one store. And then we got this store that's doing four and this store that's doing six. And I'm like, holy cow, that is, that's a large volume business. And then we look at their profit and the profit's what? It's abysmal. Abysmal. Yeah, 9%, 12%, 12%, 12%, 11%. And we're like, holy cow, you're doing a lot of work for 12%. Why are you even doing that? Yeah. Like if you actually started to really refine the small details of that business, like we like to as Savory, we get in and say, well, you're missing a, a quarter point there and a half a point there. I'm just not really focusing in. That business could be probably a 20 plus percent sleep it out business. So I would just say slow down. I think that that's the lesson for all of us. I remember in my past, um, people would always ask me, how many stores are you going to add this year? How many? It was like a quantity number of units. And I think that in this industry, we got to stop saying that. And we got to stop thinking about how many units you have. And you got to start talking about the quality of the units that you already have open. Would you agree with that? Oh, 100%. I, I, you know, we're, we see a lot of brands who their first three units have been very successful. And they believe the talk of the broker who takes them into the expensive part of town, gives them the confidence that they're going to, quote, crush it. And they go sign two expensive leases. And they, they really hurt themselves because those stores don't perform as good as the ones in their home market. They overextended themselves. Now all of their time and energy and cash flow to gen- from the first three stores are now sucking up. All of it's being sucked up by the underperforming stores. You have to be very careful, especially early, early, that the quality of your units is all very consistent and all great. You can't, you can't take that risk quite yet. I was almost going to start laughing out loud when you said crush it with yeah. your little air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the bro- brokers. Er- everywhere like, you go, oh. you're going to crush it everywhere. Oh yeah, for sure. We could, we could deploy a hundred plus million dollars if we had a dollar for every time and the real estate broker <laughs> said crush it. Well, I got to say too, for all the real estate brokers, we can't do it without them, right? Like they yeah. know the markets, but it's funny that I'll be driving in a car with a real estate broker for retail and we'll pass a Target or we'll pass a Chipotle or we'll pass a McDonald's. They'll say, that's the number one target in the universe. And you're like, that's not possible because yesterday I was in another state and the broker there told me that that target was yeah. the number one same thing, in the world. Same thing with Chick-fil-A. It's like they always pick yeah. the person who's doing well. It's like Chick-fil-A does like $70 million here. It's like, oh, that's, that's impressive. That's impressive. Never yeah. heard that number yeah. before ever. Um, so yeah, I was going to say on the scorecard though, we handed those out at Restaurantology. We're going to make that available in the podcast that we're going to have a link where you can click it and download it. So there's, there's no secret. This is our guess as to what is a great business and the information will be there. Fill it out. Look at your P&L. Look at your, uh, your, your occupancy. Look at everything in your business. Fill it out and see how you're doing. It's your own personal scorecard. And I would say do that. We also have an incredible team on the investment side that they'll take your call and help you. We, we can invest into every single brand in America, but we want to help as many as we can. We really do truly believe that a rising tide lifts all boats. That's why we do Restaurantology. That's why we're doing this podcast just to help. If we can help more, it, it absolutely helps this industry be in a better spot. It creates much better um, opportunity for founders and entrepreneurs to grow their brands and create more jobs that are much needed. Um, and it's an industry that I think is is one that's that's uh, underrated, but it's un- unbelievably fun to be part of. So I'm glad I'm in it. I, I hope you are. I know Jessica is. I'm nine years. Nine years in. Nine years in. Yeah, so you have to love it. Now, the, the proof so. is in the pudding. 
I think we're going to stick stick with it for a little bit longer. Yeah. But more to come. This one is a, a lot more of a podcast um, about the details of the business, and we'll do these from time to time. And uh, yeah, as you're listening to them too, give us uh, give us your comments so that we know what else uh, and other information you want to know from Savory. But thanks for joining.